Hi, this is Tom from ZeroToFinals.com. In this video, I'm going to be going through chronic heart failure. You can find written notes on this topic at ZeroToFinals.com forward slash heart failure or in the cardiology section of the Zero to Finals Medicine book. So let's jump straight in. As the name would suggest, chronic heart failure is essentially the chronic version of acute heart failure. It's caused by either impaired left ventricular contraction, which is systolic heart failure, or left ventricular relaxation, which is diastolic heart failure. This impairment in left ventricular function results in a chronic back pressure of blood trying to flow into and through the left-hand side of the heart. And the way I picture this is a bit like a bus stop where too many buses have turned up at the same time causing a queue of buses down the road and traffic behind them all backed up and clogging up the roads. When blood can't flow through the left-hand side of the heart and out into the body, it backs up into the left atrium and then into the pulmonary veins and into the lungs. So what's the presentation of somebody with a chronic heart failure? Some of the key features that they might present with is breathlessness, particularly worse on exertion, a cough, and they might produce a frothy white or pink sputum, something called orthopnea, and this is a sensation of shortness of breath that's worse on lying flat and relieved by sitting upright or standing. A way to test for this is to ask them how many pillows they use at night time when they're asleep. Paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a sec and peripheral edema, so they might complain of swollen ankles or swollen legs. Let's talk a little bit about paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. This is a term used to describe the experience that a patient have of suddenly waking up at night with a severe attack of acute shortness of breath and cough. What the patient will describe is waking up suddenly in the middle of the night and feeling acutely short of breath and having a really bad cough and a wheeze. And what they have to do is sit on the side of the bed or get up and walk around the room and gasp for their breath. They might feel like they're suffocating or drowning and they'll want to go to the window and open it in an attempt to get some fresh air and some air into their lungs. And these symptoms typically improve over a few minutes. What are the possible mechanisms for why this happens? Firstly, lying down flat at night time allows the fluid to settle across a large surface area of the lungs as they're asleep. This is why when they stand up or sit up, this improves symptoms as the fluid sinks to the lung bases and their upper lungs become more clear for them to use more effectively. Secondly, during sleep, the respiratory centre in the brain becomes less responsive, so their respiratory rate and their respiratory effort doesn't increase in response to reduced oxygen saturations in the same way that it would do when they were awake. This allows the person's lungs to become a lot more congested and for them to become a lot more hypoxic than they would normally do before they wake up and they start feeling very unwell. Thirdly, during the night time, their adrenaline circulating throughout their body is much lower. And less adrenaline means the myocardium or the heart muscle is more relaxed. And this worsens the cardiac function and the cardiac output, which means that their heart failure actually becomes a little bit worse at night because of the lack of adrenaline. Let's talk about how you diagnose chronic heart failure. It's important to do a clinical assessment, so take a very clear history and examine the patient to listen for bibasal crackles on their lungs suggesting there's fluid built up there to look for edema in their peripheries and other signs and symptoms of chronic heart failure. We can do a BNP blood test and specifically we use an N-terminal pro-B type natriuretic peptide or NT-pro-BNP. We use an echocardiogram and an ECG. What are the causes of chronic heart failure? Ischemic heart disease, valvular heart disease, quite commonly aortic stenosis in elderly patients, hypertension, and arrhythmias, commonly atrial fibrillation. 
Let's talk a bit about the management of chronic heart failure. And these are based on the 2018 NICE guidelines. It's worth having a quick look at those guidelines before you start doing any treatment. And this is a quick summary. So the first thing you need to do is check a BNP. Then you would refer to a specialist, so a cardiologist. And you do that urgently if the BNP is above 2,000 nanograms per litre. If uh, it's under 2,000, then you can do it more routinely. Next, it's really important to give a careful discussion and an explanation of the condition to the patient so they understand why they're having their symptoms and what's happening. Then you do the medical management, which we'll talk about in a second. And there are surgical treatments that can be useful if the heart failure is caused by severe aortic stenosis or mitral regurgitation. The final thing is it's important for them to have a heart failure specialist nurse um, giving them input. And this is useful for advice and support for patients who have heart failure. There's a couple of additional aspects to management for all patients who have heart failure. And this is a yearly flu and pneumococcal vaccine, advice to stop smoking, optimize treatment of comorbidities, and to exercise as best as their heart failure will allow them. So exercise is tolerated. Okay, first line, medical management of chronic heart failure. And you can use the mnemonic ABLE, A-B-A-L, to remember the heart failure measures. So A, the first A is for ACE inhibitor. An example of an ACE inhibitor that you could use is Ramapril, titoted as best as they can tolerate up to 10 milligrams once a day. B is for beta blocker, and a good example of this is bisoprolol, which again is titrated up to 10 milligrams as best as they can tolerate. If, with an ACE inhibitor and a beta blocker, they still have symptoms, you can add in the third letter, which is A for an aldosterone antagonist. And examples of aldosterone antagonists are spironolactone or a plerinone. And the final L is for loop diuretics and these are used to improve symptoms and you could use something like frusamide 40 milligrams once a day or bumetanide 1 milligram once a day and these can be titrated to how well they improve symptoms and you'd want to have as little loop diuretics as you can to improve their symptoms. A couple of extra details just to give you some context to the ABLE mnemonic. An aldosterone receptor blocker, or an ARB, can be used instead of an ACE inhibitor where the ACE inhibitor is not tolerated. An example of an ARB is candesartan, which could be titrated up to 32 mg once a day. You want to avoid ACE inhibitors in patients with valvular heart disease until a specialist has seen them and decided what to do. Aldosterone antagonists, such as spironolactone or aplerinone, aren't automatically started, but if there's a reduced ejection fraction and the symptoms are not controlled with an ACE inhibitor and beta blocker, then you can start one. And the final thing to note is that patients that have their use and ease or their kidney function mo monitored really closely whilst they're on diuretics, ACE inhibitors, and aldosterone antagonists, because all three medication can cause electrolyte disturbances. So thanks for watching. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, don't forget there's plenty of other resources on the Zero to Finals website, including loads and loads of notes on various different topics that you might cover in medical school with specially made illustrations. There's also a whole test section where you can find loads of questions to test your knowledge and see where you're up to in preparation for your exams. There's also a blog where I share a lot of my ideas about a career in medicine and tips on how to have success as a doctor. And if you want to help me out on YouTube, you can always leave me a thumbs up, give me a comment or even subscribe to the channel so that you can find out when the next videos are coming out. So I'll see you again soon.